All right. Thank you, Deborah, for this lovely introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I want to first say thank you to BNH Event Space for all the support in getting me back to photography after about a 20-year hiatus. So you've been really there for me. Um, I was a photographer, a freelance photographer, as a first uh, career in my youth. And when I became a mom, it soon became clear that the freelance life was kind of not for me anymore. So I transitioned into a different career for a while and uh, gave up photography altogether, sold all my equipment, uh, except my first uh, camera, which is an Nikon FE, which I still have. I don't really use it much, but I still have it. And uh, so that was that for quite some time. And then about three years ago, I just really had the urge uh, to go back into photography. And so I didn't know really how to go about it. The first thing was to find a camera, um, which I spent quite a bit of time here actually at BNH looking at uh, different options and settled for the Micro Four Third format. Um, the Olympus OMD EM5 was the first one that I got. And then I got the OMD uh, EM1, which I love, which is my current camera today. So mission accomplished. I had a camera in hand. Next was to how do you learn how to process digital images? How do you learn how to print? How do you use the camera, et cetera? So I started looking for venues uh, to learn about all of this. And I found myself right here at b and Event Space, uh, enrolled in the portfolio review, uh, the portfolio development series. And uh, this was really an amazing experience for me. I was really ready to start working. And uh, this was the perfect environment. So by the end of the workshop, um, I had a portfolio. I had a website up. I joined all the different uh, social networks. Um, I was pretty much ready, ready to go. I had a camera with me at all times. I was shooting constantly. And I was printing and processing and really having a wonderful time. And then a few months after that, um, I um, submitted my portfolio to a Soho Photo Gallery, and I became a member in October of last year. And I've had two shows there, one in January and one that's uh, up right now, actually, uh, until October 2nd. And I left a card of the show here if anybody wishes to stop by. I'll be there uh, the next couple of Saturdays from 1 to 6. All right, so let me just get started. Uh, let's see. OK, so first I'm just qu quickly going to talk about what I use. So as I said, um, I'm using the micro for third format mostly. The OMD EM1 is my, my go-to camera. I have a, a bunch of lenses that I use. Uh, most of the time, I carry with me the Panasonic 12 to 35 millimeter zoom. One of my favorite lenses is the Olympus 75 millimeter. It's a really beautiful lens. Uh, I also have uh, the Sony RX100 M3 which is a um, great little camera. It's really small, very portable. I have it with me when I can't really carry anything bigger. And of course, I use my iPhone, my iPhone 6 Plus, which is great. And I bought a couple of lenses for it at uh, the moment, the telephoto and the wide angle lens. From a, a software perspective, I pretty much work in light, Lightroom most of the time. Um, I upload all my images into Lightroom, and I convert them into DNG, and I convert them into black and white, and crop them, and start working from there. If I need a little bit more, um, I go to Photoshop, or a perfect uh, photo, photo suite, where mostly what I do there is either scale my images or put borders around them, because I really like to have a black border around my images. It kind of reminds me of uh, the old days of, of film photography, which I don't do anymore at all. Uh, there's a couple also of websites that have really a great service. One is called IFTT, which means if this, then that. Basically, they have what they call recipes. So let's say you wanted to post a picture on Facebook or on Instagram, and you also wanted to post that same pictures on different sites. So you go in there and you create a recipe that says, if I post a picture on Facebook, also post it on Twitter, on Tumblr, et cetera, et cetera. It really works seamlessly, and it's really wonderful. Uh, the Instaport site allows you to download all your Instagram pictures, which is a really great way to back up all those images. Uh, on my phone, I use uh, a few apps. I use the Photoshop Express, which is my go-to uh, editing tool. Camera Awesome is a really fun app that allows you to play with kind of silly filters and it just, just to have fun. The manual app is great in the sense it allows you to control 
ISO and shutter speed. So it's great when you're working at night with a phone and have the ability to control that. Insta size and perspective is just basically letting you play with perspective and size of the images. All right, so that's that. All right, so um, I'm a street photographer, basically. I do mostly black and white images. So I've brought quite a few to show you. So I'm not going to be talking much, but rather just showing you what I do. Um, this is one of my favorite images. It's uh, basically taken from the high line looking down. I just like the simplicity of it and the curves and the lines. Um, I have a few pictures of children. It's always wonderful to take pictures of children. Um, in this particular one, I really love the engagement of the children with the story being told. This was uh, in front of a bookstore outdoors this summer, and they're just really having such a good time. This is in front of a Chelsea market. This little boy did not want to put his coat on, and he was just really resisting, and I really like the crispness of the young child with the adults moving around him. So he was really, really didn't want to go with the flow. A young child really involved uh, with whatever was going on in his iPad, and I like the shallowness of depth of field, which really kind of isolates him even more and puts him in his own, his, his own world. This is on the high line. I like this little guy. He's just all of his pajama, and he's standing there with his uh, popsicle. Scooters are, the, are a thing nowadays. They're everywhere. Children, adults, grandparents, you see them running around in the city. I think they're wonderful. There's another one. This is an area of the city downtown by Wall Street where I sp spent quite a bit of time, and it's really a great back backdrop. I have a bunch of images um, from that area. So this is an Inwood. I found Inwood. I went there for the first time this summer. And it's just amazing how you can be in the middle of the city and feel like you're somewhere out in the country. This little girl was just uh, carrying, uh, looking for driftwood on the sand in the middle of Manhattan, which is, which is pretty amazing. I like the intimate moment here between a man and his child. I love the uh, display of affection in public by people is just kind of very quiet and, and wonderful. This gentleman played the harmonica, um, the accordion, on uh, the High Line for quite some time. I saw him regularly standing there, and it's just had this such a sadness about him, and his music was so beautiful. Just an interesting face. I like the way the arrow is pointing one way and the woman's sort of a little bit off, kind of a little bit lost. Man taking a break and letting his guard down, just sitting there, reading his mail or texting his friends. So here's another shot in that same uh, area down by Wall Street on Maiden Lane. So I think we've all been there walking down the street wondering what we're doing and what's going on. So this is what happens when you forget your glasses and you have to wear two of them. <laughs> when it's sunny outside and you're sitting in a bus and the sun is glaring in and you actually still want to read your book. So this was in a bus as the person was sitting across from me. It's in Washington Square. Person's really enjoying his music. I also like the depth of field here, the shallowness of it. It really brings him out. It's in Times Square. It's in the middle of the night. This young man has sunglasses on. He's so relaxed and cool in comparison with the insanity of what's going on in Times Square. So this is Julie Kent's last performance at the Metropolitan Opera. Julie Kent is a prima ballerina from ABT, and she just retired this year. And it was an amazing, amazing performance, and this was kind of her, the last shot of her leaving the stage. Um, 
she had a 20 minute uh, standing ovation. It was really quite incredible. I love the tattoo of the No Hate campaign here. I think these two guys were just walking around and uh, see the closeness of the two of them. This is on the subway. There's always interesting people on the subway. Love tattoos. These two sets of legs seem to be really intimate, even though you can really see the rest of their body in the picture. A little quiet moment on the High Line. Spend a lot of time on the High Line. This is again in that same area in Wall Street. As I said, I spend quite a bit of time there. When I find when I find a, back, a backdrop that I like, I tend to sort of hang out for a little bit and just wait for something interesting to happen. This seems to be like the perfect moment, these two walking down and, and the, uh, the bicycle and the man crossing on the other side. This is somewhere on Madison Avenue in the 50s. I love the eccentricity of this lady and the uh, good natureness in her face. She seems happy and having a wonderful discussion with this man. So this is um, uh, in the Meatpacking District after Pride, after Pride Parade. The after story is always very interesting to just hang out and see what's going on. Well, this is in Williamsburg. It's basically a breakfast on the ledge here. I love the uh, matching uh, sunglasses, the striped pants, and the cup of coffee against the backdrop of um, all the graffiti. I like a lot of pictures with signs in them. I particularly like the one-way sign and how very often most people are really going against whatever that way is. And this particular image, people are actually going both ways, taking their selfies or a picture of whatever it is that they see in front of them. It's a very touching image to me of a man in a wheelchair looking at the wary face of the running man. in the High Line. Um, I like the scale in this picture of the, um, the light against the size of the people and the um, fire escape. Tourists in New York always looking up, taking pictures. And if you see in the back in the building, there's a giant eye, which I thought was really cool. So the ice cream at the store under the Brooklyn Bridge is really, really good. As you can see, these three people are really, really enjoying their ice cream. This is at the bus stop. This woman was just really tired. It was 6 o'clock, time to go home, a huge yawn. And I like the man in the bag just uh, eavesdropping on the phone of the lady with the fur hat. So I did, a couple of years ago, I was walking down Washington Square, and there are Santa Clauses everywhere. I didn't know there's apparently a Santa Claus convention every year. And there are really Santa Claus, people dressed in Santa Claus absolutely everywhere in the city, and particularly in the parks like Washington Square and uh, Union Square. So these people are waiting online. Um, I don't know if you could guess for what, but they're actually waiting online for a rag and bone sale at uh, Chelsea Market. They kind of look like that's what they're waiting for. I really love murals in the city. And this one is by the High Line. I saw it when the artists were actually painting it. And um, I've stopped there in front of it quite a few times. And it's very interesting how you see uh, young couples or couples of all ages just standing there and watching uh, the painting of this couple kissing. And there's always like a really intimate moment between uh, the people on the High Line and the, uh, and the painting across. So this is the bottom of the painting. Again, a mural. And you could see how the people um, walking the street almost blend into it. It's kind of hard to tell where the painting starts and where the people are. 
again, one of those places where I just sort of stood for a while and waited for something interesting to come by. And so at a bus stop, always interesting signs and bus stops and people sitting and waiting. Eyes, they're everywhere. So I don't think you can go to any of the parks in the city and not be fascinated by the chess players. I spent some time there. This girl was playing chess, which is pretty amazing. Waiting for someone to play with. I guess this was a good day. Dogs are always also really interesting in the city. Dogs and their owners. I really like this image with the hydrant right there. I like the way the two dogs are pulling in completely different directions and the person walking them is just standing there not quite knowing where to go. This is family brunch. The dog seems very happy. I really like this picture too. There's so much going on and the more you look at it, the more you see things um, in it. The woman smoking the cigar, the dogs and the posters inside, inside the, the coffee shop. So this is our New York subway and this is Fifth Avenue and 53rd Street. It's really shameful, but this is kind of what it looks like. Really like the lines in this image and the one person just kind of waiting. It's at the end of the number one. This is one of my favorite uh, subway images. I really like the graphic of it and these two people just talking and waiting. A few more people waiting in the subway. This person in the background just kind of looks like a ghost walking through. This is always fun. I know that uh, it's kind of illegal, but it's always fun when it's there. It keeps us all entertained as we go about our lives. You're always waiting. This was taken from my apartment actually looking down. It's kind of fun playing with shadows. Lovely the young couple on the bicycle. I guess one can transport a whole bunch of things on bicycles. I like that poor young child is really ready to go home and really unhappy. Poor thing. the elegance of this woman and her bicycle going to Central Park. It's always an interesting mode of transportation. So this lady really did not want to get onto this rickshaw. This gentleman was really trying to um, convince her, but with a smile, she was kept on saying no. These two-wheelers are starting to appear a little bit all over the place. I think they're very graphic and really fun, and I really like this picture, especially with that woman in the middle. There's another one. This is right here, actually, on 33rd Street between 9th and 10th. That's a fun car. I used to be a smoker. I don't smoke anymore. It's always interesting to me to uh, see people standing outside smoking. I just, I've been there, done that. I know how that feels like. And smoking used to be a social thing. It's now becoming really more and more of a thing that you do uh, by yourself outside because you can't really smoke anywhere anymore. Another instance of that. A 
next few slides are about people at work, basically. I don't know how they do this, but. So there's all kind of work. We have performers in Union Square playing with the uh, audience. So this was a reality show. This guy was just chained and screaming help, trying to see what happens when people come by. <coughs> Teaching Tai Chi, Central Park. Bottle collectors. The next few slides are about things that are difficult to see and that are right among us every day and that we go by and it just breaks my heart. Either it's homeless people, people with eating disorders or mental illness or people having nowhere to go. It just really touches me. And I think it's important to see it and to capture it and just think about what we can, what we can do. It's raining. It's really hard. So the next set of slides is a new project that I started a little while ago. It's really about motion and um, really it's looking more at the world in, the in terms of a dance rather than a play. So it's very graphic, it's a very lot of uh, feeling of, of light and air. my favorites. This one actually was the first one in the series. Really feels like a dance. So I like that wall. Just stood there for a while and waited for something interesting to come by. been there. This is the last one. This is during Sandy. I went to um, Chelsea Piers to just see what was happening. And that's it. Thank you. So hi everyone. I'm Eugenia D'Ambrosio. And I too would love to thank David Brummer for this opportunity. Um, David's been in my life for quite some time. In fact, um, he helped to curate a gallery show that I had in June of 2012 before I um, went off to graduate school and learned a whole new way of, of shooting. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to show today, it, it's called The Seen and the Unseen, and I started looking at an issue. My work is now combined, being combined with health and photography. And so part of the show is about vision, loss of vision. And I've, I've spent a lot of time with two people that I know who have been diagnosed with macular degeneration. One has what's called the wet form, where the, all over the eye is blurry. The other has lost sight on the outside and insides of her eyes and only sees in the center. And now is having issues with depth of field, which I think you will you all can relate to. The other part of the show has to do with family, loss of information, information that will never be found again, um, information that no one ever wanted to talk about. And so, um, 
Oops. Okay. Should have had this up anyway. How I started the investigation, this was towards the end of graduate school where one of my teachers suggested I look at a, a woman photographer by the name of Uta Barth who um, uses light in her work. And so I just started to look at how do, how do my eyes look at light? How do I see it in my world? My eyes are in good health. And I was in a friend's studio when I started to notice these spools of thread. How would someone see this, this shelf if they couldn't see clearly? What information would be picked up? What information would fall away? And hopefully, in the work, I hope there's a sense of tension so that the viewer can begin to relate to what it might mean to not being able to see clearly. This next image was my great-grandmother. And I brought her into it because I had inherited a lot of things from her. I never met the woman. In fact, my mother and her brothers met her in the last three years of her life. And somehow, I wound up with her hope chest. I wound up with her cut crystal. I wound up with her dishes, service for 12. I wound up with a lot of stuff. And I wound up creating a cabinet and putting them off to the side. And one day, I, I said, I've got to look at this, because it's a part of me. And this is a representation of that relationship, where this is her, the lace that was in the bottom of her hope chest. And using a mannequin's head, draping the lace around it to reference that lost relationship. What you can see, the information that I was able to gather, and the information that I'll never know the information about the man who was my grandfather's father. Um, my grandmother had him when she was 16, which was not pr appropriate. And he was given up for adoption. And later, my, her mother brought him back into the family. So we have, we have certain images, which I, I found in my uncle's um, library, but just little snippets, just little snippets of who each person was. And, and I knew my, well, I should say I was acquainted with my grandfather, but I didn't know as much as I've come to learn. This is going back again into vision. And this is where I am referencing the lost information on the sides of the eye and the information that can be seen in the center. The same here. And this represents the blurred vision. Um, I played with this a lot, and this happens to be boiling water. This is one of the images that I'm beginning to make into a new uh, body of work, as well as these two. Last one. Um, it's very challenging. The two people that I know with these, this issue are lawyers, people who use their eyes all the time. It's really necessary for them. And are just so involved in life and in the families that they have. And I really get a sense of the loss that they're feeling as a result of um, what's happening with their eyesight. 
this last vision represents myself and what was considered my place in my family. In the family, as you notice with my grandfather, he looked great, very fancy guy. Everybody looked good, but underneath there was a lot of turmoil. And for a female in my family, you were supposed to look good and keep your mouth shut. So this is how, what I came up with. That's no longer true for me, I should say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys, hi. Uh, I wanted to start by just taking a minute or two to thank the folks at BNH. I've been coming to the event space for many years, and I've learned a lot of things that have been really helpful, both from an artistic standpoint and from a business standpoint. And uh, it's a wonderful resource to have. And I, hi, David. I really appreciate it. So to start, my name is Stephen Rose, and I'm a wedding and portrait photographer based here in New York. Um, I make my living primarily as a wedding photographer. My specialty is uh, same-sex weddings. I was originally going to talk about same-sex weddings, but frankly, 20 minutes isn't enough time to even scratch the surface on that one. However, if anybody here is interested in learning about same-sex weddings, um, I do a two plus hour webinar, so feel free to email me or hit me up after the, the uh, talk today and, and I will set you up. Uh, that is my shameless plug. <laughs> and now we can move forward. So today, actually, I'm going to be talking about my portrait work. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about a group of images I've been working on for about seven years that I sort of fell into accidentally. So here's what happened. Uh, seven years ago, I was bored. <laughs> um, my husband was out of town on business, and I was home on the weekend. And I didn't have anything to do. And this email crossed my desk uh, about a, uh, a fancy dress ball at the Montauk Club. Now, the Montauk Club is a, uh, a it's very weird. It's a Venetian palace that looks like it's been plopped down in the middle of, of Brooklyn. Uh, and, and Ray, who's sitting over there, hi. <laughs> uh, Ray and I had walked by it many times and wondered what the heck was in that place, but it was a private club, so we couldn't get in. Uh, but here was my chance to get inside the Montauk Club. And so I grabbed my camera, and I ran over, and I was going to take pictures to show the interior. I walked inside, and I barely even noticed the interior, which was kind of awesome, but I barely even noticed the interior because the people were so spectacular looking. Um, so I decided that right then and there that I really needed to start taking portraits of all of the people who were at this event. It was a, uh, a Weimar Germany party, and everybody was dressed in original clothes from the 1920s, which was pretty spectacular. Uh, and when I, as I looked around, there were a couple other professional photographers there, and all of the people who were the guests uh, had cameras too, and everybody was using flash because it was a really, really dark space and only a crazy person would use ambient. So of course, I had to use ambient. <laughs> um, at the time, th these are some pictures from the very first night at the, the Montauk Club with the, at that party. I haven't shown these for seven years uh, because uh, I've moved a lot forward since then. But I thought it would be instructional for everybody to see where I started. So I was starting with a Canon 20D, uh, which um, if anybody knows that camera, it, it had an ISO of about 3,200. That's about as far as you could push it. And that was super, super, super grainy. Uh, and um, I was also using a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens, uh, which was the most light sensitive lens I had. And I kept trying to take pictures and noticing I was having difficulty focusing. That's because my lens was broken. So I'm using a kind of not the best equipment <laughs> for the first couple of parties. Uh, but I really, really uh, loved the light I got, regardless of the fact that I was getting really super grainy, out of focus, you know, blurry pictures. <laughs> but it's still a good starting point. Uh, and, and the main thing that I took from that was I started to see the light. And I mean that literally. I started to see the light. Um, I've been. Uh, searching for those sweet spots, those areas in, in venues 
where the overhead light and the, uh, the wall sconces and the lamps and the candles, everything sort of combines and you find these little spots where the light is really flattering for your subject in, in one way or another. And I became kind of obsessed with finding my sweet spots. And so, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about different ways that I have gone about finding sweet spots in different locations. And I'm hoping, I'm, I'm a more of an instructional presentation here, so I'm hoping that you guys can all pick up on a couple of these and apply them to your own portrait work, whether you're working at a venue or a club or just at home or wherever. Uh, hopefully you'll all come home with a, a tip or two that you can apply to your own work. So we're going to start with indoors at night, which is what all of these parties started off being for me. So that's where I really started working with um, finding my sweet spots. Um, this shot was done with what I call door light. So essentially, uh, if you have two rooms and one room is brighter than the other room, uh, you put your model, you put your subject in the darker room, and then you stand with your back it, uh, in the doorway with the light behind you, and the light is shining on your subject, and it's kind of like a gigantic uh, soft light, uh, uh, softbox, sorry, a gigantic softbox, and you can get this really nice soft light and really great catch lights, I should be pointing up here, really great catch lights in the eyes, um, and it's almost like a little studio light. Um, and then here you can even see, you can see how bad my lens was. Look at all that weird edging going on here. Uh, anyway, uh, so you stand with the light behind you. If your subject is closer to you, the background gets really dark. If your subject gets further away, the light on the subject is closer to the light in the background. And so uh, you start to see more of the background, which is what's happening in this image. Uh, and then you can walk out from the doorway and you can get the beautiful side lighting. Uh, you can see where the, uh, the door light is coming from in this one. And uh, actually, uh, the door light here is from the coat check. Um, when you're in clubs and th places like that it, and you're looking for light sources, uh, I always look for where people are working because they need light to work. So uh, coat checks are really awesome spots to get that. Uh, that side lighting or the, the door lighting. Also, bathrooms. <laughs> I will uh, find the bathroom. The bathroom is almost always better lit than anything else. Uh, so I'll open the door to the bathroom, and I'll, sp I'll shine some light on my subject that way. Uh, and I'll find a nice little sweet spot, a, a little made up sweet spot in this case. Um, also, bars. Uh, if you take your subject over to the bar, the bar is always better lit than any place else in the area. Uh, you're not going to get those really nice, simple backdrops. This is more of like an environmental shot. Uh, but uh, the bar light is really pretty. And if you get a really pretty person to drink a really pretty drink, you can get a really pretty picture. Um, I find this particular club that I went to, I walked in and I thought, dear god, it's black ceilings, black walls, and black floors. There's like, what the heck? Where is the light going to come from? It was like a cave in there. Uh, but over by the bar, I, there were two wall sconces. Uh, and so I, I started to use the wall sconces. And the good thing about wall sconces, they're, they're much better than ceiling lights. You know, the thing about ceiling lights is think of them as like if you were taking pictures at high noon outside. Uh, the, the light is directly overhead, and you're going to get dark circles under the eyes and under the chin. So for ceiling lights, I usually put people in front of the lights and sort of use it as kind of a hair light. Uh, and that works if you have some other light source coming from a different location. But the great thing about sconces and, and lamps and things like that is that they're lower down. So you can use them for side lighting, uh, some nice Rembrandt lighting in this case. Um, drama. Uh, you can see the sconce in this one. It's, it's like right up here. Uh, and, you know, obviously, this is not a candid, <laughs> right? Um, you know, people don't, like, walk around like this and say hi. Uh, but um, but I, I tend to pose my people anyway. I like to pose my, my uh, subjects. Uh, and so, you know, I just have them stare off. I say, I tell them to look off into their future. And then I say, your future's up on the ceiling. So look off into the future. And, and, and you get these shots that are sort of like old Hollywood glamour shots. 
It's also really great for edge lighting. If you move the person a little bit in front of the wall scone, so it's just slightly behind them, you'll get this really beautiful edge lighting. Find somebody with a fabulous profile. Uh, at the, this guy has a fabulous profile. Uh, and, and you can create this beautiful edge light. All right, so indoors, daytime. This is the easy part. Two words, window light. Window light is the best light ever. Um, I, I use it constantly. This, this, these guys, these are the brothers Mueller. Uh, they're twins. They're actually mirror twins. So they're not identical twins. They're exact opposites of each other, which is a rare kind of twin. It's like their hair twirls in opposite directions, and their everything is the exact opposite. So that's kind of cool. So I found this room. Uh, this room is actually in uh, a mansion up in the Bronx which was very symmetrical. Everything in the room was completely symmetrical. So I put them right in the middle with the windows on both sides. Um, and because the walls were all white, the, the light from the windows were bouncing back onto their faces so they're not in shadow. But you get these great edge lights here that are coming from the windows on either side. So I'm particularly fond of this shot. Um, and here's also a really nice uh, window light shot. Uh, Think in terms of the painters, old portrait painters, Rembrandt, of course, but all of the old portrait painters, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have studio lights, right? So they were all using window lights. Uh, we, we think of a beauty and classical beauty when we think in terms of window light. And in this particular case, obviously, the window was over to the side and is lighting the side of her face. And you're getting that nice little triangle of light on her cheek there. Uh, but I'm using the back window as a way to uh, silhouette this. She was wearing a really tight corset, as you can tell. And there's a really, really great shape of the morning dress that she's wearing here. Uh, so uh, window light also super, super duper awesome. Uh, this is a, a really good example of the Rembrandt lighting I was talking about. How many guys, how many of you know what Rembrandt lighting is? One, two, three, OK, four. David knows Rembrandt lighting, but he's reading his phone. <laughs> uh, Rembrandt lighting, all right. If you look at uh, Rembrandt's paintings, he always had the faces turned a little bit to the side. And you've got the light primarily on this side of the face, but you get this great little triangle of light over here. And, and that is Rembrandt lighting. And this is a classic Rembrandt lighting kind of uh, setup. Uh, and this, I have to be honest, is not window lighting. This is door lighting. I open the door and let the, the daylight shine in. Same basic difference, though. Um, side lighting, here you can see where the window is, it's like right on the side there, right? So I put my model a little bit away, not pretty close, but just a little bit away from the window. Um, and, um, and you get the really beautiful light on the front. And, this, and the light is still shining in here, so you get detail in here. Now, two minutes later, I took this shot. Uh, different model, of course, same window. I moved her further into the corner, so there's a lot less light shining on her on that, at that point. Uh, and you get the really great edge light around the front of the face, uh, but uh, everything else falls into shadow. Uh, she was really in a dark corner there. I, I love this shot. It's very dramatic. OK, outdoors, daytime, open shade. People know what open shade is? Show of hands, anybody? One, two, three. Awesome. Uh, so open shade is uh, on a bright sunny day, you look for a cover like a gazebo or a porch or something that's covered. So there's something covering the top and, and sometimes also covering both sides. This was pretty deep in, right? So this is the subject is far from the light. You can see there's no light on the ground either. It's like he was under a, a big awning. So he's at least like 10 or 15 feet away from the daylight. And when they're that far away from the daylight, you get this incredibly soft light. You can see almost no shadows. Uh, there are no shadows against the, his feet or from against the door. There are no shadows anywhere. It's just a really, really beautiful soft light. If you move your subject closer to uh, the light, so this is still in shade, right? But uh, I'm moving her much closer. If you were to look at the ground, you would see there is sunlight, and then the shade, the shadow starts. So if you put them right up to the edge there, you get more contrast. Uh, and this was by design, of course, with this picture, because 
Uh, I really liked the way the light was falling through the holes in the brim of her hat, and I wanted to highlight her eyes, which are magnificent. So, uh, so I brought her closer in so that I could get that shade. I originally had her further back, and there was nothing there. It was just, you know, flat. Uh, so, so bring them a little bit closer, and you can get a little bit more contrast in there. And then this happens very, very rarely. This happened only once. But sometimes the subject brings their own shade. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was a fabulous hat. It was almost like she had a scrim, her own scrim, that she just kept like this all the time. So she's standing. You can see how bright the daylight is. It's like high noon. You know, It's like beating right down on her. Uh, but because of that hat, I was able to get a really, really beautiful shot, an open shade shot in the middle of a, a bright, sunny day. And look at that neck. Isn't that like the most beautiful neck you've ever seen? She was gorgeous. OK, so porticos. Um, porticos are, uh, you have a building, right? And you have a big wall. And then there's a ceiling. And then there are columns that hold up the ceiling that goes over to the wall. And so you get the shade, right? But you can see in the back here, these are the columns. And you can see the light pouring through and between the columns into the inside of the portico. So you can use porticos in two different ways. Um, you can have your model sort of peek around into the light, and that way you can get the really nice directional light. Uh, this is, again, Rembrandt lighting. There's a little corner there. She's very glamorous, Daphne is her name. She's super glamorous. Uh, or you can take the model, and you can put them against the inside of one of the columns. So I had the next shot is with her on the inside here. And you get this incredible um, wraparound light. So you have this light that comes in from outside of the column, and it hits the outside edge of the face. And it's absolutely gorgeous. This is one of my favorite sweet spots ever. I do a lot of pictures in this spot whenever I'm in this area. Um, if it's a bright, sunny day, it, people always say it's some sort of studio lighting. But it's not. It's just natural light. Also, one of my all-time favorite wraparound light shots. Same location, uh, really beautiful man. Um, and it, just as an aside, um, you'll notice this beautiful light under his nose. That's all coming from his shirt. So it's just bouncing up from his shirt. You know, uh, I, I'm sure in the back of my brain I noticed that, in my lizard brain I noticed that as I was taking the picture. Uh, but I. I didn't really see it until actually I saw the picture afterwards. So underpasses and tunnels. Um, all over Central Park, there are bridges. Under all those bridges are underpasses and, and or tunnels, right? Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to get side lighting. Uh, this is a perfect example of that. You just put your model close to the end where the light is filtering in from the side. Again, it looks like a studio shot. And one of the advantages, particular advantages to this, is uh, there's always wind in these underpasses. So if somebody's wearing a, like a light fabric, it starts blowing, and it's really, really, you know, get somebody in a diaphanous gown and just let it sort of do its thing. Uh, anyway, so it's awesome for side lighting. Here's another example of some great side lighting. Uh, and then if you move around so your model uh, is between you and the sun, you can get this. So you can get this really, really cool edge lighting. And I really like edge lighting for people with beards or really big, you know. But ideally, one day I'll get somebody with an afro and a beard, right? And I'll just get all those little, little hairs going off all over the place. I think it's really gorgeous. Uh, so uh, it's great for edge lighting, too. So indented doorways. I hope you'll all use this tip. I think I'm the only one who knows about this. Uh, so pretty much every door in New York and just about anywhere is indented, at least slightly. Doors aren't like directly out flush to the sidewalk, right? So the bigger the door, generally, the more it's indented. So what happens is, for larger doors, um, you have sometimes a three or four or five foot indentation from the street. 
and there are little walls on either side. So you have your big door, and you have a wall here, and you have a wall here. So if you hit it at the right time of day, when the light is not shining directly into that hole that the indent is, is, is creating, uh, if the light is shining straight down, uh, and you put somebody against one of those walls, and you stand on the other wall, it's like you get these really, really great portraits because the light filters in from the side. Uh, and you know what else really works for this is um, phone booths. Phone booths. <laughs> I know, but if you get the phone booth that has like a little cover on the top and you stick somebody in there and you get a nice little close-up, you get really, really beautiful side lighting. So I basically think of them all as very narrow portrait studios <laughs> all around the city. So little free, narrow portrait studios works during the day. So give it a shot. It's really, really fun to, to play around with that. All right, so we're going to get into making your own sweet spot. I actually brought a couple of light tools that I use on a regular basis. But before we get into that, um, I would really recommend that people use, find your own sweet spots without using artificial light. Learn to see the light first. Take your time. I didn't start using my own lights for like five years. I basically just went around and looked for sweet spots all the time. And the better you get at finding those sweet spots, the better you get at seeing the light, uh, <clears throat> the better you'll be at using the artificial light. Because you'll really understand what you want and what can be achieved. And you can also mix the artificial light with uh, the existing light. And so it, it just sort of having that in your head, uh, you end up with better pictures rather than just depending constantly on the artificial light when you use it. All righty. So continuous light. This was my very first uh, try with continuous light. Uh, and at this particular event, um, there was a videographer, and she had little video lights. They're little round, cheap little video lights that she had gotten on eBay for like 20 bucks. Uh, and she had three of them. And so I brought in a couple of the other burlesque performers. So we're all crowded into this room. There's the videographer and two other burlesque girls and me taking pictures. And, and I deputized them all. And they became my valves, my voice activated light stands. So I'm like, move the light up here and move the light over here. Uh, and I had a lot of fun, and I got um, this picture amongst others from the other girls. And I really liked the shot, and it sort of occurred to me that maybe I should be considering using um, some uh, continuous light sources. So I started to invest. Um, the first thing I got was the Lowell GL1. I've got one down here I could show you. But I call it my $700 a flashlight. <laughs> Although they're having a $100 rebate these days, so I guess it's now a $600 flashlight. Um, but it does, it provides a really, really spectacular light. It's sort of like a spotlight that you would use in the theater. Uh, it's very much like that. It provides a round light, and you can, uh, it has a Fresnel in it, so you can beam in and beam out. So you can get really tight on somebody or really far away. Um, it's particularly good for environmental stuff. Uh, this was from a Halloween party. This is, this is that same girl with the uh, edge lighting. This is Daphne. She's, uh, at this point, dressed as a woman dying of consumption. That was her Halloween, uh, uh, her Halloween costume. Uh, but I, 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 I was able to, again, have somebody hold the light a little ways away and illuminate the entire corner of the room so I could get this really dramatic shot. Um, and also, as I said, it's like a spotlight. And you can use the edge. Uh, the person, the, the light is actually, here, I'm going to show you this way. Somebody's holding the light right here, right? And, and you're getting the edge light. This, this uh, shot always reminds me of a John Singer Sargent painting, largely because of the dress that she's wearing. Um, but uh, it, it creates this great uh, curved edge, which is a beautiful addition for your um, composition. Uh, and also, it creates really great shadows if you want to do something really spooky, which I did in this case, and the light was below her, and I got this great shadow in the background. Also, shadows for architectural details and things. Uh, the, uh, the light was behind the railing. I had somebody go up further around the corner and, and shine the light through the railing, and that's how I was able to get 
these sort of beautiful uh, diagonal lights and, and also all the shadow in, in this here behind him, as well as the shadow on his face. That's split lighting, by the way, uh, which I don't usually do for women, but can work really, really well for men. Uh, and then the other continuous light source I use is an ice light. Uh, this is the ice light 2. I don't have that. I have the old ice light, but it's pretty awesome anyway. Um, it's not great for distance, but it's great for close-ups. It's really, really good for glamour shots. They have barn doors, so this shot was done with the barn doors, so that's how I was able to cut the light off so close in here. And, and literally, the ice light is like just out of frame. It's like here. You know, it's like right on top of her. You, you can't really do a big broad shot with the ice lights, but they're real, and they're very lightweight too, so I usually carry two. Um, and uh, so anyway, you can do these really terrific glamour shots with, with the ice light. Again, under lighting for those spooky uh, um, Halloween shots. I do, I do under lighting one day a year, and that's on Halloween. <laughs> but it's great for Halloween, you know. Um, and uh, when I'm using both, if I can get two people to hold ice lights on either side, um, I, I love this shot. You have the main light here. They're just two ice lights, and then the other one again. Uh, for the hair light, and I was particularly interested in getting that uh, because, again, I have a thing for long necks. She has a really, really gorgeous neck. Um, so two ice lights, again, really lightweight, so you might as well have two. Of course, they're $500 a piece, so you might not want to have two, but they're, very, they're worth the investment if you want to do these sorts of images. And in this case, I have one ice light hitting the model from the side, and can you guys guess where the other ice light is? Who said that? Behind him. Yeah, well, okay. Yes! <laughs> He's holding it behind his back like that. Uh, the idea here was to get uh, a dark light, dark light pattern going on. So uh, I'm going to do it over here. It's easier to see. So yeah, dark here, light, dark, light. Uh, so you know, uh, Stephen, who's this model, is who moved to LA, so I can't take his picture anymore, which upsets me because he's beautiful. But nonetheless, uh, he was a really good, I kept having to go behind him and move the ice light around so I could get it in just the right position. Uh, but uh, it, it ended up working well. I had it in my vision what I wanted to do, and this is what I ended up with. Um, and the ice lights also, if you go in the shade during the daytime, uh, can provide some really nice light. Remember I was talking about the indented doors? So this is another indented door. Um, and the light on her back, this is from the street. The light on the hat, that's all from the street. Uh, and the light on her face is from an ice light. Again, the ice light is right here. You have to have it really, really close during the daytime in the shade because otherwise it's just going to disappear. And it's not going to like overpower the sun. So don't go out in the middle of the day with no shade and expect to get a really nice, you know, it's not going to happen. But if you find a good shady spot, it can be really helpful. And this little girl was in the Easter parade this year. Uh, again, the ice light, it's like right there. It's like right out of frame. You can see it in her eyes. There's the catch light in her eyes. Uh, but it added just that little kiss of light over to the side to give it a more of a dimensional feel. Uh, so um, uh, my lesson for you guys is to take lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of portraits. Um, I've been doing this for like seven years. I have a, uh, my favorites catalog in Lightroom is uh, 4,800 <laughs> portraits. So I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of portraits. And the reason why is because sometimes you'll get a really great opportunity. So I was doing uh, event photography for a party uh, for a group of chefs, celebrity chefs, uh, who were um, trying to uh, promote gay rights in Mississippi. Bless their heart. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, right? But yeah, that's a tough road, you know? Uh, and so I did all these great portraits of the celebrity chefs. Uh, but of course, the main attraction that evening, their special guest, was Morgan Freeman. And I really, really wanted to take a picture of Morgan Freeman. But I didn't want to interrupt the dinner. And they said, don't bug him. 
So I'm keeping my distance. I'm taking a couple of like party shots of him and stuff. Um, and, <clears throat> and they're serving him his food, and then they're serving him wine, and then more food, and then more wine. And then did I mention there was wine? <laughs> so by the end of the night, he's very happy. And he's like taking selfies with everybody. And I'm like, I got to get, I mean, come on, man. I can get a picture of him, can't I? I mean, he's taking selfies with everybody. So uh, his date actually saw me looking really anxiously at him. And she came over and said, do you want to get a picture of Morgan? It's like, I would kill to get a picture of Morgan. She said, OK, I'll bring him over. And so he came over, and he was a little tipsy at this point. And he says, all right, all right, all right, where do you want me? And I put him against the wall, and I gave the ice light, in this case, to my handler. And I was like, just turn your head to the light, and I'll take a quick shot. And he was like, OK, 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 OK. And he turns his head away from me. He's like, OK, OK. And then he starts giggling. And then he's like, OK, OK. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it was Morgan Freeman. It was the Morgan Freeman, you know, with like gravitas and everything. And I'm like, click, 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 click. And then he starts laughing and starts giggling again. And that was it. I had six seconds. I actually looked at the time from the first picture to the last picture. Six seconds. So practice, 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 because you don't know when you're going to get your six seconds with Morgan Freeman, <laughs> or whoever your Morgan Freeman ends up being. So when that time comes, you're going to be prepared, and you're going to be ready, and you're going to be able to get a good picture in six seconds. Uh, and so that's my lesson for you guys. I hope you found something that was useful for you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.